And I, uh, I want to preach on this subject here, how to read a wine label. That's what I want to preach on, how to read a wine label. I do not make any bones about it. I believe in truth in advertising. I think that when you look at me, I am 100% biased. I'm in favor of God and God's word. Amen. I don't, you know, there are people who says, well, you got to have an open mind. Mine's about as wide as a mosquito's leg. Yeah. <laughs> I believe Amen. God said what he meant and meant what he That's said. Right. And so here's how to read a wine bottle. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a raging. He that is deceived thereby is not wise. When you see a wine bottle, read it this way. The contents of this bottle have side effects like woe and sorrow and contention and babbling and wounds and redness of eyes and may I add redness of nose. Uh, the truth of the matter is when you see a wine Bible, or a bottle, you ought to read it this way. It bites like a snake. It stings like a cobra. It produces adulterous eyes, filthy mouths, dizzy balance, misperception of mind, physical altercations and fights, and ends up addicted. So look not on the wine. When it moveth itself aright, when it worketh itself in the cup, it will it will destroy you. Amen. Now that's how you should read a wine bottle. Of course, now we got cultured people, you know, and they 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 put the labels on the excuse me on the bottles, and they they have a lot of information there. But I feel I'm as cultured as Kaz Walker or Dolly Parton, uh, and I think whenever you Read that wine bottle, see that wine label, that ought to come to your mind. That God has put a label on it too. And God is uh, truthful in advertising. And alcoholic wine, the way you see it in the liquor stores today, it'll destroy you, it'll destroy your family, it'll break your home, it'll break your heart. And it'll leave you penniless and down there at the rescue mission or in jail or somewhere. That's what it'll do. I want to preach on the uh, Gospel of St. John, chapter 2. And uh, I've got a lot of things I want to say here. Uh, but let's read, first of all, uh, John, chapter 2. And I'll start reading at verse uh, 1. And I'll read all the way through verse 11. John chapter 2. You say, preacher, you talk like you're a teetotaler. You got it, pal. Amen. Amen. I don't, I'm, not even, I'm not even fond of taking medicine that's got so much alcohol in it. I'll show you about that in a little while. Amen. Baptists say, well, the doctor gave it. Well, get you another doctor. <laughs> Awful quiet in here. Amen. John chapter 2, let's see what this says. And the third day, the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. She is already there. Now, whenever you study about the mother of Jesus in the Bible, remember that we're talking not only about Mary, but we're talking about Israel, that he's a product of the Jewish nation. And here's this wedding, and she's already seated. You see that? Amen. Well, let me keep going. Both Jesus and his disciples uh, were called to the marriage. How'd that work? I didn't read that right. But you know what it means. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, and I just stopped long enough to, to tell you this, Nowhere in the Bible that I know of does he ever call her mother. Now it talks about it talks about her being his mother. But notice what he calls her. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. 
That's the same thing that he addressed that Samaritan harlot as, isn't it? His mother had no more authority than the Samaritan woman had. Why? Keep on going. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast saved the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Did I pray? Haven't prayed yet? Man, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Thank you today for the privilege to pray. Thank you for that blessed old book called the Bible. Our Father, it's our guide, it's our road map, it's a light to our path, a lamp unto our feet. And Lord, we want to hide its words in our heart that we not sin against you. God, what you say and what you allow is what we want to do. We're unable, Father, to guide our own footsteps. We need an outside source and you gave it to us in this book. Help us to do what you said for us to do in your book. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we get too far started in this sermon about wine, I want to tell you why the Gospel of John was written. The Gospel of John was written according to chapter 20 and verse 31, that you might believe. That's what it was written to do. And that by believing you might have life through his name. John 20, 31. The events that happen in the gospel of John. The miracles that take place are illustrative, I think is the way you pronounce that. They are not all that Jesus did. They're all that would be necessary for you to believe. John chapter 21, verse 25, if everything that Jesus did was all collected and wrote together in the book, John said, I suppose the world couldn't contain the books that should be written. But these are written that you might believe. That's what this is about, to help you that you could have faith in God and by having faith in God that you might be saved from your sin and get to go to heaven and might be saved from your sins here in this life and live a life that's pleasing to God and helpful to your fellow man. Look back at verse 1. It said the third day. The third day. Now, if we would trace that down way back in John chapter 1, verse 29, he talks about the next day. And then in 35 and 36 of that same chapter, he talks about the second day. And then in chapter 2 and verse 1, he talks about the third day. Well, if you'll notice on the day that he starts out, the day after, and when he speaks of that day in John 1, 29, he speaks about the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what it is said that Jesus did. That's what he came to do to take away the sin of the world. The second, the second day, John is still talking, and he's talking about Jesus as the Lamb that should be followed. Do you see that in verse 35 and 36 of chapter 1? And then in the third day, in chapter 2 and verse 1, there's a wedding. Now let me put this down here. Yeah. The first day, we've got Jesus taking away our sin. The second day, we're following him. And the third day, we're headed for a wedding in the sky. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Wedding day. And if you'll notice that it says on that day, he manifested his glory. Hallelujah. He revealed his glory. You may not be able to see it yet. But thank God one of these days we're going to see him in the glory. Won't that be a wonderful day? Won't that be a glad resurrection morning when we see Jesus Christ? Glory was beheld in John chapter 1. It was made flesh in John chapter 1. But it was manifested at the wedding. Now what I'm saying is day number one was Calvary. Day number two was living for God through the church age. And day number three is when we're called out of here to, to meet the Lord. You're not allowed to shout your own preaching, are you? Let, let, let me say, day number one was a great day. The day that I got saved, the day that I went to Calvary, that was a great day. But let me tell you that day number two was a greater day than that when I realized, hey, not only did I get saved, I'm going to stay saved. That if I follow Christ, amen, ain't nothing in this world going to be able to turn me around. But a greater day than that is that day that's pictured at the wedding. Amen. The greatest day of all when he comes down in the clouds and he says, come up hither. And we go up to meet the Lord in the air. I like that. I hope you do. We'll try to get back to our lesson. Amen. In the story, the wine runs out. Now, uh, let, me, let me go back to our earthly footnote. In the Bible, when we're talking about, and I'll get into this later, when we're talking about the wine that God approves of, it, it's, a, it's a, a drink that brings joy to people's heart. Not a false joy, a true joy. And, and the, the, how am I going to say this? The joy run out the day you got married. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Lots of times, lots of times, you know, you see people and said, I saw him last year and he was smiling from year to year. But he didn't smile this year, he got married. <laughs> I, I saw him last year and they were tithing. But he didn't tithe this year, he got married. What, hap what happens to us when we get married? We quit courting. Amen. We got her now. Ain't no need for us to be good to her now. So we just blah, 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 yak, yak, yak. Am I telling it right? The, 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 the joy ran out the day they got married. I remember the day I got married. You thought I was going to say I remember the day the joy ran out. The day I got married was a long time ago, 44 years ago this year. I got married to the sweetest little girl in the state of West Virginia. Well, I'll just say, go ahead and say the sweetest in the world. And it's been a good life. She's been a good woman. She's been a good host. Amen. I might just have to put her out to pasture. But, but she's been a good horse. We're going to take care of her. Lord willing, we're going to feed her till the day she dies. Or the day I die, I'm going to die trying. But what I'm saying... If I can get off of this, let me, let me hurry up and go real quick. If your joy run out, you call on Jesus, and he can turn the water into wine. If you don't have any joy in your married life, then you put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, and he'll bring joy to your life. There's joy in the camp. Amen. You'll quit beating on mama. You'll quit beating on the children. You'll quit all you running around. If you'll just get in touch with Jesus Christ, he can give you joy back in your life. Bring your water to Jesus. He'll turn it to wine. Satan's a liar. We know that. He's been lying all, all the time. He's a corrupter. And he corrupts anything and everything he can. And the, there's many a modern drunkard that has been taken in by the word wine. Now we're going to, if, if, we, if we can understand this, that Satan is out to corrupt the English language. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a, a, a decent, well-intended 1611 sentence. That gay couple 
was over there drinking their liquor. They sure must be in love. If you would have said that in 1611, you know what they would have thought? Not what you're thinking. You know why you're thinking corruption right now? Because the devil has twisted our language. He has twisted it around to where the word gay don't mean gay. And the word love don't mean love. And the word liquor don't even mean liquor. Let me help you. The word gay in 1611 meant happy. Amen. The word liquor meant anything liquid. And the word love didn't mean lust. It meant you cared about each other. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. The devil has tried and he's done a pretty good job of corrupting our language. That's why we've got to stick with this old book and the way this old book was written because it tells it the way it is. And one word that he's corrupted, that's not all, man, I could go on. I could talk to you about the word John. Amen. Has he corrupted the word? Uh, but let me, uh, there's a whole bunch more I could say I'm not going to. I want to zero in on this word wine. He has corrupted, the devil has so corrupted the, wine, the word wine that when we think of it today, we think of an alcoholic beverage. But in 1611, the word wine meant anything from the grape right on down to the finished product, any product thereof. Uh, a wine would be a grape. Wine would be vinegar. Wine would be alcoholic wine. Wine would be just anything that was a product of the, of the vine. And it meant something that was pressed. Or pressed out. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 14, if you'd like to write this down. Wine is the pure blood of the grape. The pure blood of the grape. In Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 8, it talks about the new wine. And that new wine is found in the cluster. Not in the bottle. Now what's found in a cluster? Have you ever held a cluster of grapes in your hand? That was called wine. In Judges chapter 9 verse 13, wine cheers God and man. In Proverbs 9, uh, 3 and 10, the Bible said, If you're right with God, God, that is the Old Testament promise, that God would cause your wine presses to burst out with new wine, and you'd be pleasing to God Almighty because you had that wine. If you compare that, to, to Proverbs chapter uh, 23 and verse 32 where it said wine bites like a snake. If you compare it to Hosea 3, 1 where it said the love of wine is the mark of someone who's turned their back on God. Can you see that wine is used in both? You know, used in both, both sentences. Wine might be and the context is what determines. The context is uh, whether it is talking about grapes and grape juice or whether it's talking about fermented alcoholic liquor. Now, Proverbs 23, 29, the Bible said uh, uh, that wine is the author of woe, of sorrow, of contention, of babbling, wounds without a cause, redness of eyes. In verse 33, wine is responsible for adultery, for a filthy mouth and foul language and the inability to even recognize that somebody's beating on you. Now which wine is that? Is that the wine that Jesus made at the supper? If Satan can corrupt the language which he has, he can destroy your faith in the Bible and he can convince you that the Bible is outdated and not worth believing. And so he's doing a good job of it. In fact, folks are just, just willing to swallow whatever Satan puts out there. And that's a big deal today. Take this, this pill, this, this drink, this whatever, put it in your mouth, and all your problems will disappear. I think I heard that in the garden. 
I think when he came up to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said, if you'll just eat of this tree, all your troubles will disappear. You'll be like God. You won't have any problems. Everything will be rosy from that. He's a liar. He's a liar and he'll lie to you and he'll destroy you and destroy your home and destroy your family. God's word condemns alcohol. God's word condemns alcoholics. God's word condemns people that make it. God's word condemns people that sell it. And God's word pe- condemns people that give them a license to sell it. Anybody that touches with it. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15. Woe unto the man that puts the bottle to his neighbor's lips. Years ago I preached a sermon that alcohol was not a product of nature. And I got a firestorm of protests. People come to me and they said, Well, preacher, you know what you're talking about. The birds and the bears up at uh, Cranberry go out there and eat them grapes and get drunk. If you don't believe it, you uh, ask a, a game warden. They'll tell you about it. Uh, they will ferment and produce a, a, a drink that will literally make every animal in the woods drink. More than one person accosted me, and they said they had saw drunken bears. And they had saw birds fly into cars and puke all over the windshield because they are drunk from eating poke berries. Well... I'm not a chemist, I'm a preacher. And so uh, I didn't really think I needed to ask a game warden. But I thought I could ask a chemist. Oh, squirm. You can go on the internet and you can click on the videos and they'll show you drunk skunks. They'll show you skunks that can't walk. They'll show you bears that are falling down and they'll claim these bears have been eating these wild poke berries and the poke berries had fermented and they'd got them drunk and these bears is drunk. That's what the game warden said. That's what the newspaper said. That's what everybody told me 20, 25 years ago. But let's ask a chemist. I've got three different chemists and I'm not going to get in. I'm not a chemist. I'm a preacher. But this chemist from the University of Chicago said poke berries are a strong emetic. That is, they produce vomiting. And they are a real danger, a potential poison to any animal that consumes them. But the bird is not drunk. The bird is sick, nigh unto death, and he's puking his guts out, not because he's under alcohol, but because he's been poisoned. Berries do not produce alcohol. Berries rot. <laughs> well, don't, don't, don't come. You go prove it to me. Go talk to the chemist. Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe they are drunk. You can look at them and see they're staggering around. But that same chemist said they produce in animals. Is it quiet in here? Every once in a while, like we say, hey, man, preacher. That same chemist said that it produces in animals a behavior very similar to rabies. Have you ever saw an animal with rabies? I saw them. You ever saw a domestic dog with rabies? They'll run into the car, the house. They'll run into trees. They'll run into you. They'll bite anything that moves. They'll slobber at the mouth. They'll run around. They'll fall down. They'll get up and run around again. Hey, hey, listen, I'm preaching up here. Are you telling me that God makes that? Are you telling me that Jesus Christ at the wedding supper in Canaan made a bunch of wine to get everybody staggering around slobbering and puking on each other? You better study your Bible. Did Jesus make alcoholic wine? Never in a million years. Never in 10,000 times 10,000. They tell me berries don't contain enough alcohol. Or enough sugar that man had to add sugar. That man had to add leaven. And when man adds, when man invents, 
Amen. When man adds to what God has said and puts sugar and leaven in it, that's when you get the alcohol. My doctor said I needed to get me a glass of wine. Change doctors. The Bible teaches total abstinence. No wine at all. None. A wine bibber in the Bible is a is a, actually he's just a sipper. But do you know that being a sipper can get you addicted? God's people, 23, 20 of Proverbs, are not to be wine bibbers. The very next verse says, Drunkards and gluttons shall come to poverty. Now here's what alcohol does. Alcohol destroys brain cells. If you, if, and I, I'm going to give you credit. If it takes uh, 12 beers to get you drunk, then one beer will destroy one-twelfth of your brain cells. Amen. And if you continue day after day after day after day, seeking that wine, looking after that wine, and I might add this goes for that dope too, it destroys your ability to think. Alcohol destroys your ability to function. Amen. Whenever you read a wine label, you read into it the truth. And the truth is, at the last, it'll bite you like a viper. It'll bite you, it'll sting like an adder. And you'll be laying in the gutter or laying in jail somewhere. And you'll waste it 10,000 times. You'll listen to that old redneck preacher that told you leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. It destroys your brain cells and they do not reproduce. You just have to go with deadened cells. 1 Timothy 5.23 Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Now which wine do you think he's talking about? Do you know that alcohol does nobody no good? But one of the best food products you can get is grape juice. Did you? Are you aware of that? When we're talking about using a little wine, we're not, ta- we're not talking about you using a little alcoholic fermented hooch like they sell down at the liquor store. I started getting me a bottle of wine and bring it tonight. be honest with you, I didn't know where to buy it. Somebody said I could buy it at the liquor store and somebody else said I could find it at the rescue mission. Somebody else said I could... Somebody else said I'd go to some Baptist houses and get by. <laughs> if you live in a place that's got bad water, such as Timothy lived in, and you have an opportunity to use grape juice, amen, you'd be better to add that grape juice to your water because it has a purifying effect. Alcohol. And I, hey, listen. 35 years ago, before I ever come to Esther Baptist Church, I went, and, and I wasn't candidating. These people came and asked me what I'd be interested in pastoring their church. And they said, well, preacher, uh, we use alcoholic wine for communion. And I said, uh, well, I wouldn't be interested in serving that. I was just a young preacher, didn't, didn't know much, but I knew better than that. And an old Mossback deacon, you know, they most of the time run these Baptist churches. Amen, hallelujah. Can I get an amen out of you, Philip? All right. These, that's one of my deacons. He said, well, don't you know that once it is distilled into liquor, it, it, it never goes bad? Are you crazy? I mean, if you can blackberries, they'll last for years and years and years. But if you break that seal, it'll go bad, pal. And I don't care if you've got a hundred proof bourbon, when you break that seal and leave that seal broke, it will go bad. It's not representative of the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you crazy? You are nutty. What, (laughs) What you are trying to do, 
You're trying to be a tool of the devil. Now you got a poor guy in here that he's uh, kind of uh, weak toward alcohol anyway, and you're going to feed it to him. The first and only time that my wife ever drank alcohol was in church. Whenever she first got in church and she went to the beach and I wasn't with her. And she went to a Baptist church and they was having communion. We probably ought to have closed communion. But anyway, they was having open communion. And she didn't know. They offered her the communion and she took a drink of it. And it was alcoholic wine. And the only time that my wife has ever had alcohol, she got it in church. Now, when that pastor, if he stands before the judgment seat of Christ, when he, st- I'd hate to be, I'd hate to have to bear that responsibility on me. You know one thing about it, I have got your attention. There ain't very many people sleeping tonight. Wine is a mocker. In that 1611, you just looked at the context. And whenever you'd see if it was joyful and happy, you'd know it was talking about the fruit of the vine. If it was biting and stinging and causing contention and trouble, you'd know when it was done been fermented and turned into alcohol. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake. He told Timothy that. In the same book, he said, The bishop is not given to wine. All right, the wedding. No wine. Uh, Israel's first public miracle. You remember I told you why the book of John was written? That you might believe. Israel's first public miracle was what? Their first public miracle was what? Can anybody tell me right quick? Just hold up your hand and say, I know, preacher. Their first public miracle was Moses turning the water into blood. Under the law, under the law, all you get is death. But when Jesus come along, his first public miracle was turning the water into wine. Amen. All you get is joy. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm a Christian. Now look at chapter 2 and verse 6. It said there were six water pots of stone uh, containing two or three firkins apiece. Well, what in the thunder is a firkin, preacher? I'm glad you ask. A conservative estimate is seven and a half gallon. So if it contained two or three firkins apiece, it contained 15 or 22 or... You understand what I'm saying? Each pot. And each pot, a water pot uh, uh, of the Jews was used, look at it, that was used for purification. You remember when they got in that fight Over there in the third chapter of John, they got in that dispute about the purification with John the Baptist because he's out there baptizing people. And they said, well, that water's supposed to be, don't that water save them? Man, I need to preach something else here. Uh, 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 But let me say that that the, the purification they were talking about was ceremonial purification. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, it's talking about the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling Uh, uh, signified to the purifying of the flesh. Well, in Numbers chapter 19 and verse 10, the water was part of that purification process. Now, whenever they asked John about it, he said, uh, the bridegroom is the one that's got the bride. I mean, I might be here administering some kind of purification ceremony, but I want you to know it's the bridegroom. That's got the bride. We're not up here talking about some ceremony. We're not up here talking about the purifying of the flesh. But we're up here talking about the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse your conscience to serve the living God. The Word is the water that cleanses according to John 15 and 3 and Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Now you are clean through the Word that He's spoken to you. The blood is what cleanses in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 and the Word was made flesh and the Word poured out His blood just like that grape poured out its blood. When they would put that grape in that press and they would mash and squeeze that 
That wine out, uh, that blood out of that grape. It was a picture of what they were going to do to Jesus when they got him on Calvary. Uh, uh, they mashed and squeezed on him until the blood came out. Uh, they crowned him with thorns. Uh, the blood came out. And even when he was dead, uh, uh, that Roman soldier came with that spear and pierced his side. And out came the blood and the water. And I'm saying that it was representative of something. And what it was representative of was the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all our sins. He will give you joy and he'll not add any sorrow with it. I've never saw a happy drunk. They say so and so. Otis is a happy drunk. <laughs> I've never saw a happy drunk. Everyone I ever saw was coming home with their car wrecked, beat up, the fenders tore off of it. Hey, man, they didn't even know they'd been in the fight and their jaw were hanging down here. They going home to mama and they spent their paycheck. Am I telling it right? Am I, they ain't happy. You call that happy? Hey, man, there's no joy in that. But I'm telling you what, man, you get a dose of this new wine I'm talking about, Amen. You get a taste of the water I'm talking about. Water of life that'll bubble up inside you. And where you going, preacher? I'm going to church. Amen. Got my Bible under my arm. I'm headed out down the road. I'm going to the house of God. That's where I'm going. I'm going to sing and I'm going to shout. One guy said, we don't allow no shouting in here. Well, you're sorry. You're sorry, sucker. Don't allow shouting. You better get you some earplugs when you get to glory. They shout up there. You better get you something you go to hell because they moan and scream down there. This is the quiet place. I think I want to be friends with Jesus. And I, I think I want that joy that comes when he turns the water into wine. Let's bow for prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one looking around for just a moment. Aren't you glad tonight?